I believe that the biggest paradigm shift in the next 15 years um, is going to be that individuals are going to own their data again mm. um, and not companies. And that you have something like an app store where then you can choose, you know, different companies providing you services in different areas of, of your life, just consuming data from your personal data wallet. Um, and you can at all times see, it's like a little data cockpit, at all times see which company um, is consuming what data from your personalized data wallet to provide what value. And you can decide um, who to share which data with and who to stop giving access to. So um, if that's you know the new world, um, the most important currency for companies um, is going to be trust. Today's episode is brought to you by Exige International. Exige is an executive search and recruitment training business that Fiona and myself have been working on for the last 19 years. We provide technology and innovation focused executives to the insurance and wider financial services sector with a focus on the UK and Swiss markets. If you have a search or you'd like to discuss improving your recruitment and interviewing process, please visit our website, Exige International. Exige is spelled E-X-I-G-E. And tell the team William sent you. I'm also very happy to introduce our new sponsor, Crank House Coffee. Crank House Coffee is run by Dave Stanton, producing some of the UK's most exciting coffees, available for dispatch all over Europe. With a host of single origin and hard to find coffee, expertly roasted with care and attention, Crank House Coffee is a true gem of a business. I've been drinking this coffee for years and I am thoroughly happy to have them as a sponsor of the show. So just head over to crankhousecoffee.co.uk, that's crankhousecoffee.co.uk, and you can use the code William to receive a special discount. In today's episode, I interview Julian Tyker, CEO and founder of WeFox. WeFox has raised over $250 million and is one of the hottest insurtech brands in Europe, the first $1 billion valued insurtech unicorn. And so I wanted to have Julian on the show to learn why he chose insurance as his place to land. I'm also keen to understand and learn from Julian how he thinks about technology and business and what experiences have shaped him in becoming an entrepreneur. It's a great chat and we'll explore a lot about data and trust and also the realities and pressures of being a founder alongside his personal development and well-being practices. I hope you enjoyed the conversation. So without further ado, I'll give you Julian Tyker. Julian, welcome to the show. It's great to have you here. Pleasure. I'm happy to be on. Great. I mean, Julian, WeFox is one of Europe's standout insurtechs um, with a rumored valuation in excess of 1 billion. Um, you have over 500,000 customers. It's clearly been a hell of a journey so far. And, you know, when you look at your profile, you see that you've been involved in quite a few different companies. So you're, a, I mean, the term, I suppose, serial entrepreneur, someone who likes starting new things and getting involved in new things. So I, I'm always kind of wondering, as an entrepreneur who has decided to spend the last five years with WeFox, why did you decide to do that in insurance? What was it about insurance that really interested you? Uh, it was nothing uh, about insurance that interested <laughs> me. Um, so, so basically, my dad was in insurance when growing up, um, and uh, I quite early made the decision that I never ever want to have anything to do with insurance uh, in my entire life because I just thought it was so boring. Um, and I wanted to go into fast-moving uh, fast consumer goods technology, um, 
uh, build technology that has, has an impact on millions and millions of people's lives very, very fast, you know. Um, so I jumped into startups um, and uh, I built my first own startup uh, in 2010 um, and we scaled that up. It was an e-commerce, very simple business model. Um, we scaled it up to around 100 million in revenues um, to a couple of hundred uh, employees. Uh, we turned it profitable um, and we exited the company. And that was in 2015, um, where I still remember uh, my co-founder from that company walking down the aisle uh, in our office in, in Zurich um, saying, hey, um, we have to look into insurance. Um, it's super hot right now. Um, and I said, um, no, I'm not interested in looking at insurance. Um, my dad has an insurance. Uh, you know, that's uh, definitely not the area I'm going to work in. Um, and then he said, you know, just give me 30 minutes. There's this guy who wants to meet us. He made a lot of money with insurance. Um, and he just wants half an hour with us, right? And he's a friend. So let's sit down. Um, so um, this guy comes in. Uh, a few days later into the office, um, we're completely non-prepared. Um, that was the only discussion we had about insurance, literally that kind of 30 seconds. Um, we're sitting in this room, we're talking about technology and insurance. It was more like a brainstorming discussion. Um, and then uh, this guy all of a sudden says, I'm in. And my co-founder, he's the best sales guy I know. Uh, and he was uh, instantly like, all right, you can have 10% for 300,000. Um, and then he was like, ah, I want more. I was like, that was, that's the last offer I'm going to give you. So they shook hands and I walk out of the room completely confused. And I'm like, what the fuck did you just do? <laughs> um, and you know, basically that was the beginning of, uh, me being in insurance. Um, uh, I, it wasn't my choice. Uh, we just had money. Uh, we didn't have a team. Uh, we didn't have an idea. Uh, we had nothing. Uh, but we just had to start. So I, 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 I would lie if I tell you, you know, um, you know, I, I, I breathe. I always breathed and lived uh, insurance for my entire life, and it's my absolute passion. It has become though since then. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. You know, I, I sort of hear in that that most people, most people I speak to who are in insurance, I hear a very similar thing, which is like, I never dreamed of being in insurance. I never you know thought about when i was back in school um you know thinking that's i want to is it i want to be an astronaut i want to be a firefighter or i want to be an insurance man or woman and um i know that's that's true but it, there is something enticing about the industry nonetheless the people who are in it tend to stay in it for a long time and tend to find something so i i sort of wonder what what has kept you in insurance then why are you excited to be in insurance now then yeah i mean uh, you know i obviously had to find purpose in what I do, um, because I, I wouldn't be able to just do something. Um, and I was thrown into it. And, you know, I remember these family parties, you know, uh, my dad being an insurance broker and my uncle uh, being a pilot, right? Mm. And everyone, when growing up, was like surrounding my uncle and he was telling all of these passionate stories about flying, right? And my dad was sitting in the corner all by himself. Everybody's scared that uh, he would sell them something, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, the image of the insurance broker is screwed up. Um, and I made it, you know, my passion to um, create a or help create a new image for the insurance advisor and help create a new image for the entire industry. Um, and I really became passionate um, about that plus the entire purpose um, of enabling people to be safe. So uh, with technology, what we can actually do um, is return insurance um, to its core, um, which is, you know, about safety and community, helping each other out. Um, that entire purpose um, over the last century has been diluted. Why? Uh, because money often dilutes purpose, right? Um, and there was so much money in the in the game. Um, and um, insurance CEOs, you know, had to return profits um, and um, uh, essentially managed a money printing machine mm -hmm. um, where essentially for every 
you know dollar they got into the system, they would then reinvest that dollar uh, into the capital markets, make more money, uh, and pay out less than what was paid in. So essentially, it's just a money making machine, and all you had to do as a CEO is just figure out how to get more money uh, into the cycle. Um, and the best way for such an abstract product as insurance is to get Salesforce um, and ask them what do you need to you know sell as much insurance as possible to get as much money into my money making machine right um, and uh, they would tell you make it as confusing as possible you know uh, make it as complicated as possible um, so that I can essentially sell overpriced insurance products that I can sell double coverage um, you know that way I can bring you the most money right um, and that system worked for like a hundred years right um, and um, uh, that purpose of uh, now creating something truly customer centric um, uh, and helping insurance advisors with technology to consult their customers significantly better with the right products, plus thinking even one step further of reinventing the entire insurance product from uh, reactive protection, so financial protection uh, from uncertain events. So. Um, the insurance experience is a really boring and terrible one, right? So uh, you answer a couple of questions. Mm. You get a price. You buy a policy. You forget what's the fine print, obviously, because it's so complicated. Something bad happens in your life. Um, and in the best case, the insurance company pays back money, right? So the entire experience is pretty shit. Um, and with data... Um, from our devices, uh, we're going to be able um, to turn insurance into um, proactive protection from likely risks, right? So we're going to be able to tell you about your risk profile right now and give you um, information about how to increase your risk awareness to decrease your risk, live a safer, longer and healthier life. Right. Um, and it's actually in the interest of the insurance company. It's in the interest of the insurance advisor. It's in the interest of the insurance customer. As a customer, I'm going to have a safer life. As an insurance company, I'm going to have a lower loss ratio. Right. As an insurance advisor, you know, I can essentially um, do the right thing um, and get rid of that image um, that has been created um, through insurance being this money-making uh, machine without a soul. Mm. So, so I hear in that, I mean, I hear in that there's a lot of interesting benefits to the future of insurance that you've just highlighted. But one thing that sits with me at the moment with all of that is this giving up of personal information. Because mm -hmm. you're sort of highlighting this story where, you know, I, you can develop a risk profile of William Layton and, you can tell me, you know, what my blood pressure is, maybe what my um, what my exercise levels are like, you know, how much caffeine I'm drinking and how that might affect my where I'm living, all of these components. But at some point, I'm going to have to give you that data. And so that's troubling, though, as well. Right. This this idea of ownership of data and sharing it. So how what are your thoughts around that, Julian? Do you think it's a problem? Do you think we should just give up all our data or do you think it's something that um customers are already doing so yeah how, how do you do that how do you get the information that's going to enable people to make those decisions yeah i mean it's the biggest uh, discussion of our entire generation um essentially um i always say you know the last 20 years um, we have given data to a facebook uh, and the google we ask facebook you know or told facebook what we like we ask google you know um what we're looking for and it was a conscious decision. Mm. Um, so I did this in an active move. Um, now with the IoT data revolution, we have all of these devices, they collect data about us and they share this data directly with other companies um, without it going through my consciousness. Mm. So essentially these companies uh, know more about myself than I consciously know about myself, right? So that's why this entire discussion um, is, you know, the most important of our generation. 
right? Um, and, and I think the movie Social Dilemma shows the impact um, of what has happened over the last 20 years with society and the risk going forward quite well. Um, and that's why us tech entrepreneurs definitely have a, a huge responsibility when it comes to um, the conscious use um, of data. And, and this is also one of the topics I am most passionate about. Uh, how can we use the advances um, in technology uh, in favor of the development of society um, and not um, to create more damage? Um, so when it comes to insurance, uh, the question is, um, from my perspective, quite straightforward. So, um, of course, actuaries would really love to have all of this contextual data in order to price much better mm. um, and do discrete pricing, right? And I think that's very dangerous. Um, it destroys, again, the soul of insurance. Insurance is a beautiful product, right? Because, um, you know, you're, you can imagine it as a group of friends or, you know, a little village, you know, um, all knowing each other and saying, hey, um, you know, um, we're going to take care of you. Of each, we're going to take care of each other, you know, in case something goes wrong, right? Uh, unexpected in someone's life, right? Um, and um, it's really about solidarity. So that whole topic of using contextual data for discrete pricing, I think is a big danger. Um, but where I can really draw a line is um, using contextual data um, in order to increase the awareness about risks and the likelihood of bad things happening. So, um, of course, this is about trust. Um, of course, this is about Chinese faults between essentially the proactive service and the data that you're collecting that may not get you know to um, the uh, actuaries and that are pricing the products, right? Um, you may not be of disadvantage, you know, um, if you um, have certain pre-existing conditions and stuff like that, right? Mm. So we have to be extremely uh, responsible uh, about this development. Um, but yeah. the answer is not to put your head into the sand and just say, you know, I'm just going to ignore all of this development and I'm just going to continue um, doing insurance the way we have before because um, some people are going to do it, yeah. right? Uh, we're going to have, uh, what is it, like five to ten devices uh, by 2025, every single person. Right. Mm. Somebody's going to do it. I'd rather have people that reflect on how to do it right do it um, than people that just try to make money. You know, it's an interesting one you hear you say that because I'm, I'm, I don't think about my own personal experience with, with insurance. I will give up my information, but only if I can trust those who are assessing it to assess it in the right ways. Yeah. So is this, is, is that what worries you about this hyper personalized information or is it more going to move to this model then of just us choosing those communities of insurers who really understand our lifestyles? I, I don't know. What, yeah. Where would you take that? Well, I think it, it, it's not only um, insurance. It's going to happen to all industries, right? Um, so essentially, I believe that the biggest paradigm shift in the next 15 years um, it's going to be that individuals are going to own their data again mm. um, and not companies. And that you have something like an app store where then you can choose, you know, different companies providing you services in different areas of, of your life, just consuming data from your personal data wallet. Um, and you can at all times see, it's like a little data cockpit, at all times see which company um, is consuming what data from your personalized data wallet to provide what value. And you can decide um, who to share which data with and who to stop giving access to. So um, if that's, you know, the new world, um, the most important currency for companies um, is going to be trust 
Um, so we're going to have to think about completely new um, ways of how to generate trust mm. with our consumers on how to prove via technology uh, that we are not misusing um, your data, um, that we are not doing anything against your will, um, that we're not putting you into a tough spot, right? Mm. Um, and on the insurance, this has a huge impact, right? Um, so an insurance company may never ever um, have um, access to all of your data, right? Um, because just imagine that example of having, you know, um, IOT devices, sensors, you know, in your body, um, uh, them detecting, you know, some type of illness and insurance companies just switching off <laughs> your insurance coverage, right? I mean, there's, um, uh, very, very bad scenarios, you know, that can play out and, um, you have to have, you know, um, uh, a, a balance of power um, and um, the data collected may ever never ever be used for price discrimination may never ever be used for underwriting you know uh, the data collected may only be used to increase your awareness based on science right um, based on the latest science mm. um, on how to reduce your personal risk yeah. um, and that a function uh, needs to be completely separated, right, from the function um, of uh, the pricing decision or the underwriting decision, right? To complete this, this is based on solidarity, right? And the other piece is feeding solidarity, you know, but it's not discriminating. So when you say solidarity, what, what do you mean by solidarity? Solidarity means. It is good for a group of insured if the individual lives as healthy as possible. Mm. Right. So that's what I mean with solidarity. Mm. Yeah. You know what? I've been thinking on this idea of our, our I mean, hey, we're, we're in a, a global pandemic right now, <laughs> right? Where um, we're effectively making decisions to protect each other. There is our, we are making decisions to wear masks, to, to, do things in a responsible way, which protect ostensibly those who are the most vulnerable in our societies and communities. So I think there's a real truth to that, an important message that insurance, you're right, is actually about making our societies more resilient, more capable of withstanding you know, the unknown instances that happen. And that's where it came from, right? With these guys in the Lloyds of London sitting there deciding upon whether or not they were going to underwrite that boat. So they were going to put some money to that boat that was going to try and go and be the, the first entrepreneurs getting out there to try and bring back um, their cargo and, and sell it in, in the markets in London and all around the world and Amsterdam and such. So, yeah, I mean, that's right. It is it's a very interesting idea and social dilemma I thought it was a very interesting program, particularly as it focused in and around this awareness for people that data, the data that we're sharing at the moment with these organizations like Facebook and Google and many others is allowing these institutions to change our minds. That's what I thought that was one of the most interesting um, observations from someone saying is, look, it, it's not... They're not buying your data so they can just advertise to you. They're buying your data so they can actually change your mind, change your mind on decision on things. And I find that to be a very scary thought, but obviously very honest as well. Um, and, and maybe that's what you're at. I, I hear what you're saying, that we should recognize as we give that data up what people are doing with it. And do we acquiesce? Do we, do we consent? And how does it help us? But that's a big journey, Julian. I mean, that's going to take education. I mean... I mean, how the hell do you do yeah. that? No, it's a huge journey. <laughs> well, it's a huge journey. No, I, I, that's one of my projects. Uh, so I created a foundation, um, uh, which is a non-profit foundation, um, to help create um, a ecosystem of where data um, is owned by the individual, right? And yes, it's a complete moonshot. Uh, it's a journey with um, lots of enemies uh, along the path. Uh, you're kind of mm -hmm. going head to head with the Googles and the Facebooks of the world, which are not bad people, right? 
Um, but they're very powerful. They got, they got a lot the invested. <laughs> the system, you know, um, makes it very hard for them to be, you know, doing good, mm. right? <laughs> mm. um, and and I just believe we have to, you know, learn from what happened over the last twenty years, um, and we have to stop um, development um, that has gone in the absolute wrong direction. And um, we have to make the individual the sovereign of this data uh, and not these um, huge corporations incentivized by interests of their shareholders. Mm. Um, and that's why we, it's, it's, it's more than just you know, a new business idea or business model. Uh, it's really about a new uh, concept for a digital society. Mm. What's the name of the nonprofit if people want to find out a bit more? It's called Holy Holy Foundation, right? Um, and what we do is actually we have built technology um, that um, acts, uh, or it's, it's basically like a second phone on your phone. It's like a safe on your phone um, where you can collect all of your personal data. Um, nobody can hack it. Nobody has access to it except yourself. Um, and you're going to, you know, essentially um, have access to the data cockpit and you can then choose what companies uh, to share that data with, right? And for companies in this new age that we're trying to um, essentially promote here, um, there's lots of advantages. I mean, if you're able to generate the most important currency, which is trust uh, with your uh, customers, all of a sudden you're going to have access to significantly more data points mm. than you had before and you don't even need to collect data on customers because they give you access to their 360 degree profile already right um so and it's always up to date so it's like a real-time crm system mm. um for millions of all sorts which is a dream come true yeah. uh, for any business right yeah absolutely i think this is actually what i talk about in in recruitment actually the the in headhunting we have this we've been doing highly personalized selling for 20 30 years and it's i say to people why when they're when they're when they're headhunting when you're selling a role to somebody and an individual you should be listening intrinsically to what that individual wants what motivates them what it is about their life they want to change and what your the opportunity you are representing can do for them and how they can be part and it's like this hyper personalized service that we provide and isn't the holy grail that has been for so long for marketers is that you can create that hyper personalized experience but at scale and that's mm. i suppose what mm. the algorithm the, the databases in facebook are doing right they're creating the opportunity to really model a julian and a william and go okay there are ten thousand other people like you and you can go and sell to those people but i love that idea that we can say well i want to have a hyper personalized career experience so i want to tell you exactly what i'm like i want to have a hyper personalized insurance experience for my healthcare, uh, maybe for the type of um music that i like to listen to art everything it could be a whole range of services so that's that's very interesting so yeah uh, <laughs> and essentially uh, if you look at uh, artificial intelligence um i mean it's it's great right um it can help humanity um, but if we um have these algorithms be owned by these super powerful players um that are incentivized um, by their shareholders' interest mm. to make more money. AI has the power to destroy humanity, right? Um, and what we believe is a beautiful vision um, is um, what we call AIU, right? So uh, artificial intelligence is owned by you. You have your own, you know, artificial intelligence, right? And it's um, in your data wallet um, and it's highly personalized as it knows you very well um, and it can help you um, essentially in the areas where it knows you are weak right and where you need support right um, but it's very important that the incentive um, is 
of the owner of the AI is aligned with your own mm. incentives in life. Um, and that's why it needs to be the same. Mm. Um, uh, and the incentive is to, you know, be uh, satisfied, you know, and, uh, and, and live a good life. Yeah. Um, and that's why AI needs to be owned by you in order to support you um, and not be owned by people that want to make money off of you. Mm. The, the idea of the danger of AIs, I think when people don't realize the danger that's inherent within an AI is that we program AIs, we get, they are created through sets of data and they inherently then become as biased as the data that they're fed. And I recognize these concentration. I actually thought about it in, in the recruitment from a recruitment point of view, there is a race at the moment, you may or may not know, to create um, these these AIs that will be able to filter out and interview candidates at scale. But the issue is, and has been for a long time, is the underlying data that goes into those, those AIs, those machine learning algorithms, which then can have inbuilt biases that those recruitment experiences that they're, they're programming them with actually have. And it's... Um, I definitely can see a world where you would have a whole spectrum of AIs that are um, have to be hyper-personalized. They have to look after you because otherwise you could be, like you've put, really exposed to the, the whims of, I suppose, decision-making processes that and external forces that you otherwise at this moment have no idea about. Um, yeah, I think we, we stumble into that with without our, with with we should be stumbling into it with our eyes open <laughs> and it's going to be a very interesting challenge to see how that affects the type of hyper personalized world that we're moving into yeah very interesting well thank you very much for sharing those thoughts um, let's let's like um let's pivot back to insurance for a moment because i think this might be going back here i mean so julian you've been you know you've been working in startups for a long time now and being an entrepreneur and i think most people don't realize that one of the most common experiences in startups for an entre and for entrepreneurs is failure, right? So I'm wondering, what are, your, what are your thoughts on failure? How important is failure to you? And you know, what advice would you have for entrepreneurs on, on, on how to deal with failure? I have never failed uh, in my entire life. I'm kidding. <laughs> 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 um, no, I mean, you know, it's the only way um, to uh, to grow. Um, so if you look at you know, this uh, entrepreneur's journey or anyone's journey, really, um, it's uh, around, you know, uh, stepping into a situation uh, you have never been in before. You feel super vulnerable. Uh, and you will fail. Um, you will have a big emotional reaction, mm. right? Um, you might like fall into a crisis um, and um, you get through the crisis um, and you're a more reflected, better, you know, more loving, more caring, um, more productive uh, individual. <laughs> so, you know, um, without that, uh, you, know, you know, you can't grow. So, um, so I think um, that's why I think entrepreneurs are, or entrepreneur, uh, entrepreneurship is the best vehicle for personal growth um, because you're constantly thrown into situations in which you've never been before. Um, and you get so much negative feedback um, and um, you're pushed back and you're pushed down um, by so many people um, you fall down so many times every day, right? Um, that it's, it's basically like personal growth uh, in a super pressure situation mm. every day. And um, and you have two ways on how to you know somehow cope with it. Uh, many founders um, <clears throat> can't cope with it and try to numb themselves, right? <laughs> um, and take drugs, mm -hmm. right? And just in order to somehow survive um, uh, with the pressure. Uh, and others, you know, um, take that as a learning opportunity um, to to grow 
um, and reflect. Um, and, you know, there is a lot of pain involved in the process, right? Um, and at times you're basically say, I cannot do this any longer, right? Uh, and why am I conflicting, inflicting so much pain on myself? I need to stop, right? Mm. Um, I need to live a, a life, a, a different life, right? With le less pressure, with less uh, expectations, with uh, less people, you know, wanting things from me. Um, and every time I've been in that place, you know, I opted for, no, let's continue with the pain. <laughs> Give uh, me more. <laughs> So maybe that says all, all entrepreneurs are sadomasochists in some sort of way. I don't know. <laughs> so how do you deal with yeah, that? But the great thing is that the things that have um, created pain in the past yeah. uh, don't create pain any longer uh, once you've gone through, right? Yeah. So my hope, I don't know if it's gonna, ever going to happen, is uh, that at one point, you know, I'm going to be, I'm going to be fine, right? But um, <laughs> the, the the problem is um, the challenges, you know, just become bigger. <laughs> yeah. I think so, I spoke to, I had I had David Soloff on the show who one of my early guests and David is a serial entrepreneur has created a few companies and he said you know being an entrepreneur is the only industry where you can feel like you're on top of the world in the morning and you want to shoot yourself in the face in the afternoon it's um it's just such a wild ride um and maybe that's why it's also so damn exciting and people get drawn to it as an industry I mean, I, I mean, how do you deal with it, Julian? I mean, you're you're still a young man. I mean, you're still learning life. You're still, you know, growing. But how do you deal with all the pressure of having a company that's in the in the the news that has this incredible evalu evaluation that you've got all these different interests and people, all the things you've just highlighted. I mean, what do you have a personal well well being sort of regime that you you look to 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 help you? Or what do you do to manage the stress? The stress. You know, I'm. I have a coach. Um, he helps me. Um, so, uh, you know, once per week, I'm actually today. Right after this, I'm going to have my session with him. It's it's an one hour session. Then once per month, I have a whole day, right? Um, and <clears throat> you know, it's just um, outlining essentially uh, what are the things that are currently happening in my life um, that cause irritation um, that cause unknown feelings that cause anger uh, and trying to figure out okay um you know why mm. um and uh and and, and just um, to to help me cope with all of the situations uh, much better so so i think there's no way but and i always say it's, it's alpha you know you're in your comfort zone um and that's where people want to be, mm. right? Um, but um, you're at one point, right? Whether you want to or whether you're forced to, right? It's always happening, mm. right? Uh, uh, but people that don't want to um, will be forced to, right? Um, uh, you will see that your perspective on your life and the world um starts not making sense anymore right starts somehow crumbling right um and i call that moment better mm -hmm. right so you're going down and um and you're faced with new emotions uh, uncertainty vulnerability insecurity um and then you know you can either embrace that feeling or you can try to you know stick to your old world uh, and try to just somehow force to stay into in that comfort zone mm. um but if you embrace it it's not getting better it's getting worse right so you're getting to the gut phase which is kind of rock bottom right everything is confusing right because um if you change um you will give up and lose a lot right you might lose friends um, you might, you know, even uh, lose your partner, right? You might lose your job, right? So there's lots of things that 
a change within you will create in your environment. Um, and that creates, creates a lot of confusion. So you're going to, you know, hit rock bottom at one point. Um, and then still many people try to jump back, right? Um, and, and then you will, uh, if you go through it and embrace it, um, you will get to Delta, which is, you know, you come out of the valley, but higher than you entered. Mm. Uh, and you have learned something new and have new opportunities all of a sudden. Um, and I think, you know, working with somebody um, and going into this process in a very reflected manner um, essentially helps you to uh, make the valley less deep, mm. um, and less painful. It's kind of like a guided, you still have to go through it, right? Mm. But it's a guided and gentle process, right? And I used to think, no, you know, I have to, you know, lie on the ground crying, right? And only then, you know, I'm going to get it. And that's only the real deal. That's the real deal, right? <laughs> and even worse, I thought I have to make other people lie on the ground crying, <laughs> right? Um, and no, and, 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 and with this coach, you know, it's just like less of a, a you know, deep valley yeah. that you go through. It's a bit of a gentle process. I'm, I'm great to hear you talking about having a coach and I... I took a coach as well and I coach individuals and I always thought there was, there was a bit of a stigma attached actually, you know, well, why do you need a coach if you're successful? You know, you've got money and you've, you've done a lot of good stuff, you know, sure you don't need one. And, um, actually it is a very lonely place. Sometimes being a leader as well, sometimes running a business and, but also fact is we all have blind spots, right? And they're called blind spots. We can't see them. And having somebody else's perspective to highlight what you've just talked about, these, these new emotional frameworks that you weren't otherwise aware of, and then you can make them, instead of being subject to them, you can be object. I mean, this is the work, actually, of my desk. This is the lady I just had on the podcast, Lisa Leahy um, and Robert Keegan have done some amazing work. This is Immunity to Change, a book they've done. And mm. um, Robert Keegan specifically is very well known for his sort of at stages of adult development and the various mental models that people go yeah. through. Um, and Lisa was on the podcast talking specifically about this model where we have to become aware of our um, our underlying sort of big assumptions that are going on in our life, the things that we can't even see, but they're underpinning all of our behaviors. And maybe that's what you're talking about, because when we get exposed to these new experiences, our, our underlying assumptions are trying to pull us back to somewhere to safety by applying the mental models and, and the, the emotional frameworks that we have, but they can be very limiting. So often we have to change, and that's really difficult. Like you said, you have to be that 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 bottom point is very difficult to be there and to find a way out sometimes on your own. So I would fully recommend, and I can be an advocate for coaching. So I'm, I'm glad you, you've, you've taken that up as well. How did you find your coach? Just, just out of curiosity, did you, was this someone recommended to you? Do you have any recommendations of people who are interested in finding a coach? Well, I've always had coaches. Um, and um, there's, you know, two different types of coaching. Right. Um, you know, one is rather shallow models um, that can be used in a broad context. Um, for example, in a one to many context, right? Um, and that creates a lot of value. Um, but um, only at the beginning. Um, and then you have um, the other uh, type, which is going, you know, very deep uh, and it's extremely effective. Um, much more effective than the first mm. um, for real transformation. Uh, and that typically only works in a one-to-one -one context and a lot of time investment, right? So um, I've had coaches on, the, on both sides um, and I was looking for someone who, um, you know, kind of has figured out on how to combine the best of both worlds and um, cre create real transformation at scale, mm. right? Um, and no, that's how I met, um, uh, his name is Dava, um, and he's been, you know, uh, a Buddhist monk for 12 years, I guess, um, eight years of which he was in silent retreat. Uh, so he, tip, he he definitely did some, you know, thinking. <laughs> he had some time to think, you know, um, and, and to reflect. Um, and um, 
and he just you know has great approaches to coaching um which you know go very deep um and um work uh with many people mm. um even one to many context are you are you doing any meditation is that part of your your routine yet or is it something you're looking into <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I do. You know, way too little. Um, Don't we all? <laughs> and I have like a super pro as a coach, you know. Um, <laughs> but uh, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely far from you know super coach. I, w- I was uh, super pro. I was just you know on holidays, mm. and you know the. I, 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 it's very difficult for me to you know stop thinking. Mm. Uh, I try to leave my phone uh, in my hotel room when going to the beach. Um, and I became so anxious, like a you know drug addict, um, <laughs> getting off heroin or something. Uh, and it was not nice, right? It was like holidays, but you know I was just like feeling terrible at the beach. Um, so yeah, yeah, I have a long way to go. Um, well, thanks, but yeah. Th- thanks for that honesty. <laughs> I, I I started turning my phone off after watching the social dilemma and leaving it downstairs, and I felt I felt just the same, like some type of like anxious addict about where the hell this this device had gone and you realize oh my god well i can re- fully recommend the um some just you know don't beat yourself up about meditation i'm i'm exactly the same and um i think any practice is better than no practice very interesting you raise about sort of these one to many versus these deeper methodologies um uh, my recent conversation with lisa they talked about sort of technical um challenges and adaptive challenges technical ones you can affix with sort of kind of quite simple processes um technical adaptations and then real deep adaptation challenges are much more complex but require that deep work that you've talked about they talk about it in those senses and i i can certainly um appreciate what you're saying and and anybody listening to the show who wants to find out more about this stuff we'll obviously put some links in the show notes and um link to the book and check out the podcast also with lisa it's a, a fascinating topic um i i would um before we sort of finish up, I'd like to maybe just move on a little bit if I can, um, mindful of your time. But, um, you know, your, where you are now, sort of what's sort of brought you to where you are and the approaches to your work. I mean, who has influenced you either right now or in the past that you think others could really benefit from, from checking out? Yeah, I mean... <laughs> I think the major impact is, you know, the way I grew up, um, and uh, and that's nothing that you can replicate. <laughs> I'm not sure if you want to replicate. It. <laughs> um, no, but you know, I've seen a lot of suffering and pain, you know, when growing up, um, and I think that's, you know, my major driver um, in, you know, figuring out how human collaboration you know, can be brought to another level um, that's significant, more efficient and more peaceful. Um, so that that's kind of my main driver. Um, do, you want, but, do you want to share a little bit um, more about that, about what it is you experienced that really has kind of moved you in this direction? You said pain and suffering. Is that sort of like your background as a child? Is it like growing up? Or what, how would you... I'd be interested to know what you mean. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's essentially... Um, you know, just you know, a huge amount of interpersonal conflict um, to a level of, you know, complete confusion um, that happened around me while growing up in my family, right? Um, and and I think, you know, this witnessing this for, you know, the most important years of my development is, uh, you know, a huge driver um, for me. And, you know, I'm, I'm also, you know, uh, becoming a father now. My, my wife is pregnant. Congratulations. Um, and, you know, I'm always thinking, you know, um, most entrepreneurs uh, that, you know, have a big impact, you know, they have really, really traumatic experiences, right? Mm. Um, and I... I I obviously want the best for my child, right? Mm. Uh, but sometimes I, I catch myself thinking um, whether I shouldn't start a startup that would uh, essentially 
do some type of like controlled trauma for kids, you know. <laughs> that's going to take some regulatory because... approval. I think that's, um, yeah, I don't know. I, mean, I think I prefer your personalized data locker to that one. Um, <laughs> let me see where you're going with. Do you know what though, Julian? I think this is actually, I mean, first of all, thank you for sharing a bit of that. And maybe someone will pick up another time. But I think, you know, my own experience as well. I, I come from a family, my, my parents divorced very young and there was definitely a period in my life that was chaotic and, and um, we moved around a lot as a child and which meant that I reflected on this actually with a, with another guest, uh, Sheila Heen. And we talked about that. I think about my time as a child, I had to move around a lot. I went to something like 13 different schools when I was a child because my mom was in the property market trying to make money as a single parent, which meant that I had to get really good at making relationships with people and I think you get these traumatic, it was traumatic though, absolutely right. Um, but that has become a great asset in so many ways later in life in creating relationships with people very, very quickly. So um, I, I really think that's an interesting observation you make. So Julian, um, I greatly appreciate your time. Thank you so much for joining us. As we sort of wrap up um, today's interview, I'd like you maybe just to share three books that have um, really influenced you and maybe that others could um, go and find. So yeah, do you have three books that you could share with us? Yeah. Yeah. The first one is um, a book that, you know, has inspired me a lot in terms of, you know, how to build, you know, scalable organizations and, and how to, you know, see the organization um, itself um, uh, as purposeful right um uh, having a purpose um and, and that's called it's a book called reinventing organizations from frederick Laloux. um and i think the great thing um that uh, it does is essentially show how um organizations <clears throat> are a great uh, tool for development of consciousness and how individual consciousness of employees um has an impact on collective consciousness um, and how the um, level of productivity that comes from an organization uh, essentially is based on the increase of consciousness of an organization. So um, that, that book helped me a lot in terms of you know, understanding um, why I'm so passionate uh, about building organizations. Um, the second book um, is um, Harari. I mean... Uh, yeah, I've read all of them, but I think the 21 uh, Lessons for the 21st Century is, 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 is great, very practical, um, and really shows, you know, the challenges um, that we have to solve. Um, and of course, you know, climate is a huge challenge for our generation, but um, I think the um, technological advancements um, and the challenges um, surrounding you know, the IoT data revolution and artificial intelligence are even more urgent um, and can cause really severe social unrest um, in the next few years. Um, so um, I think I think that book outlines it, it, nice, it nicely. And then uh, the third book um, is uh, The Subtle Art of Not Giving a Fuck, which I think, you know, is great because... Great title. Obviously... <laughs> You have the whole perspective of Freud, right? Um, that says you have to analyze everything that happened in your past. And you have the perspective of, I think, you know, the other school, Jung, mm -hmm. which is, no, um, the past has no impact. Um, all, all you have to do is just, you know, separate from your past, be in the moment, do the right things and be successful and happy right and separate from your past so and i think you know <laughs> both is important you have to kind of be aware of the things that trigger you mm. and at the same time be able to uh, eliminate your triggers and do the right actions and trigger the right thoughts in the moment so i think it's both that's important um mm. and this book is you know reminding uh, me of the importance of uh, you know, not giving a fuck <laughs> because um, uh, it's really your life um, and it's about 
the right choices for you uh, and being less worried mm. um, about um, what has happened to you in your past and what this means for the future. Uh, but just live the moment. That's fantastic. So we've got Reinventing Organizations from Frederick Lelux. Le, Le Le I pronounced them terribly. Uh, 21 Lessons from for the 21st Century from um, Yuval Harari and The Subtle Art of Not Giving a Fuck from Mark Manson. Fantastic. Great recommendations. Yeah, yeah. Um, Julian, I have greatly appreciated talking to you and hearing you know your view on the market um we spent a little bit of time talking about insurance at the beginning but seeing what you're going on to next i think is, sounds fascinating as well and i wish you and the, all of the team at WeFox great success in what you're trying to do um if people would, would like to sort of you know reach out get in touch see your you know sort of do you have places you're doing the social media thing where can they where can we where can people find you yeah i do the social media thing i still try to figure it out <laughs> you know uh, <laughs> So, you know, on LinkedIn, uh, I try to do this uh, Instagram thingy. Uh, so I post the stories. Um, and, and Twitter, I completely suck. I don't know. Like, I don't get it, but I do it. Okay. So, what, 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 so, so if you want, if you want just put, um, it's Julian. Um, what, what's your hand? What's your, you know, Twittery thingy name on, on Twitter? What, what, how can people? Uh, Twitter is. I, I, it's just Julian Tiger. I'm not exactly sure. Julian, how, put Julian Tiger into exactly, social media, yeah. folks, <laughs> and you'll find him somewhere. Yeah. Um, founder and CEO of WeFox. Julian, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you very much for joining us. Yeah. I've truly appreciated hearing you. Um, and um, well, until good luck with everything. Thanks a lot. Take care. Have a good one. Cheers. <laughs>